reward, uh, if there's no benefit, then it's really hard to kind of stick with it. And I think it's, that's why we see a heightened amount of relapse with meth. But um, no, that was beautifully explained. Yeah, I forgot to turn on the recording. Um, is, th is this depression different from other kinds of depressions in terms of how it feels and, and the recovery process for it? Yeah, it, it's kind of a, I guess subjectively depression probably feels just bad and yucky no matter what. But this particular version, when it's, related to that period after we've kind of stopped the addictive behavior and where our brains are kind of adapting. Um, it, it has kind of a unique blend of a couple of different characteristics. Uh, one is it has that depression, but it's kind of um, this depression as related to kind of nothing's interesting. Is that kind of blah feeling about life? Um, but there's also this element, there's a layer of hopelessness in there too. And that has also to do with brain chemistry where as, as the uh, dopamine reward system gets messed up by the addiction, uh, addiction also kind of cuts off the, the neural pathways that connect the prefrontal cortex, which is the adult in the room, right? The, it's the, our ability to, to re reduce impulses and to have some chance of resisting a, a trigger or craving if it lights up on us. And, and so people are especially heightened toward impulsivity. They don't have much impulse control. And there's an, this other additional layer of hopelessness. And so you add all that together and it's a pretty uncomfortable place to be. That compared with regular, say a biochemical depression, which has a heaviness and a lethargy about it. It's kind of hard to get out of bed. Um, this isn't necessarily that kind of slow, um, what we guess I call a psychomotor kind of slowness to it. Uh, it, it just feels slightly different, I think. And by the way, you can have both of those. It doesn't mean that you don't have one without the other. If you're in that um, post-acute um, phase of, of addiction, you can also be depressed uh, because of the consequences. You know, the, the you find yourself in the, you know, relationship issues or legal issues or money issues or whatever your addiction has wrought. Uh, that all is depressing too. So it's kind of compounded. It's a it's a a difficult time for sure yeah um and just just how long does this addiction induced anhedonia or depression how long does it last um how long does it take to snap out of this right, it's a great great question so it there's a little bit of variation um the rule of thumb i usually tell people is at least probably 90 days um you had talked about a year and when we look at actual brain studies uh, and here's the bad news, for methamphetamine users, uh, it could take up to 24 months for the, the brain to kind of get back, we think to baseline, it's really hard to measure that, like are, am I back to normal or not? But, but basically you feel normal, which is the important part. Um, but, but it can, meth is by far the most damaging and it can take up to 24 months. I, it's really hard to measure that for sex and porn addicts because of the, it's not the chemical markers, but I think uh, I, I would suspect it, just even based on your anecdotal experience, a year is probably not unlikely for a serious addict. Uh, and it gets better. It's not that dreary state all the time. It, there's a gradual improvement, um, but it, it, it can last a while. We know that the younger you are, the faster that repair occurs. And so if you're older, it can take a little bit longer. Um, but if you've compounded with different kinds of drugs and behaviors, it can, it can be a pretty serious blow to your brain that takes some time to, to take back. Now, the, the amazing thing is, is our bodies and brains are remarkably resilient. And so they do have the capacity to kind of do workarounds and to compensate and, and all this stuff. But still, uh, this is a huge challenge and it's just, it, it's a slow start back uh, for sure. Yeah, I'm really glad this question was asked because I think a lot of people new to recovery, whether it's chemsex or just general addiction recovery or even recovery from the intensity of living with an addict who's now getting sober. Right. Right. Um, there is this sort of, there can be a pink cloud, which is wonderful, but there can also be sort of malaise. Um, and, and it's good for people to know that this is actually fairly normal and your brain will readjust. I mean, right. Um, and and th I think this happens to betrayed partners too. The intensity of living with an addict, is oh, almost, sure. it does the same thing to the brain. Right, no, it, it's the, the issue here is intensity and it, no matter what the source. So if the source is porn and sex and amphetamine, or the source is the trauma and constant crisis of living with an active addict, 
um, you're, you're still experiencing the intensity and, uh, and, and your, brain is comp your, your brain and body are compensating for it and trying to adjust to it. And so when that level of intensity changes, hopefully for the better in recovery, um, we still have to go through that adaptation back to where we were. So yeah, it's, it's a long process. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take the next question out of the chat feature. I'm trying to take them in the order they're coming in. Um, any suggestions on healing oneself when one is living with someone in active addiction? Um, the addict uh, does not want to discuss the issue at all. Yeah, that, that is a painful uh, situation. And I think the best advice I could give in that scenario is to take care of yourself. Um, if the addict is um, not hearing, not wanting to engage, not wanting to move uh, toward recovery, at some point it becomes kind of, as we talk about recovery being a selfish program. I think it has to really, you have to take care of yourself. And, and that means you know, the physical healing, the, the emotional space, the spiritual, whatever, whatever you need. And, and that may require physical separation and may require certain boundaries, but you really have to kind of evaluate and take care of yourself. I think, especially partners, it's so easy to kind of fall into that trap of just focusing on the addict and trying to get them to change and uh, all that energy. And, if, and oftentimes, ironically, the more the partner pushes, the more the addict digs in, right? So you get this unfortunate kind of cycle that starts to happen. But in those scenarios, uh, as long as you keep dancing that same dance, and sometimes couples have danced that dance for years, uh, you're going to get the same outcome. So I think one way to kind of change, change um, the, the kind of rules of engagement a little bit is to do something different. And that may be to, to back off and start taking care of yourself and setting boundaries, um, which is a whole other conversation, because as we've said here before, if we set boundaries, we need to be able to follow through on whatever those are. But, but I think I, the, the Takeaway there is self self care. I think I think I'd really work on you and yourself and getting the support you need, building your support networks, getting that connection. You know the same factors that we emphasize to the addict in terms of the healing potential, which is that connection, right? The the um, staying present with other people uh, that that works very much with the partners as well. So I think it's just to really take the focus off trying to fix or change um, or even help the addict and just really um, focus on yourself. And that feels hard and weird. Um, and it may be, I, I think many times partners require support in this because um, a lot of times even simple choices of like what to do or what's, what do I do in this situation for this kind of boundary, it, it's hard to kind of come up with that. We need help from other people that may be more objective. So I think that's where that the support networks really come in handy where you can talk about these situations and get the support with people who've been there, who understand what's going on. So yeah, yeah. self-care all the way. Yeah, and I, I just wanna add, um, there's nothing wrong with you for loving and caring for and staying with an addicted person. Um, all that means is you're a loving and caring person who, who wants to find a way to help and wants, wants to continue loving someone that you care about. Um, if you end up in the wrong support group, um, Codependence Anonymous, I don't want to, uh, a lot of people get a lot out of it, but codependence model kind of insinuates that there's something in your childhood, you're repeating your trauma, you need to change, um, or nothing will change, and, and um, we don't love the, the blaming and shaming of that. Um, I suggest reading Dr. Rob's book, um, Dr. Rob Weiss's book, Codependence, um, and if you're interested, um, there's a new 12-step group starting up for partners of addicts called ProDependence Anonymous, um, ProDependenceAnonymous.org. There's a couple of meetings going. I think they are only online at the moment, um, but I expect that group will go. So you might want to look into that. Um, and, but um, if you read ProDependence, all the things David just said, they're covered in detail in the book. Um, highly recommend it. Um, so... Um, I love this next question. Are there negative thoughts? Oh, how much time do we have, Scott? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's interesting. We were talking with the clients earlier today about um, negativity bias and some of those things. Um, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, there are negative thoughts. Um, the thing is, you know, of course, there are negative thoughts, there are positive thoughts, there's all kinds of thoughts. It's where do we turn our attention? And what, how do we kind of habituate some of those thought patterns? And I think we can easily um, start to get into this cycle of, of focusing on the negative, seeing the negative, 
um, and only getting caught up in that, not even at, after a point, um, you know, it's that glass half full versus glass half empty thing. Uh, we can really uh, start to omit any kind of positive thoughts from our consciousness. We don't see them anymore. And so I think it's really important to, to, try, to try to strive towards balance, uh, to take those negative thoughts, understand what they are, deal with them, process them, do some reality testing with them, talk about them, get, 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 mix them with some daylight and see, see what's there. But um, I think w one really effective tool, I think for that, uh, besides just being mindful and conscious of what you're doing is gratitude. And we talk about gratitude probably every week um, and rightly so, but, but gratitude is a great method for um, kind of forcing yourself. And, and sometimes when I most need gratitude, I've, I, I really am resistant to it. I don't want to, you know, I want to stay in my negative space. Um, but gratitude really forces you to look for something that you're grateful for. And, and that could be all kinds of things. And once you get in that habit, it really does temper the negativity. And I'm not saying it makes it disappear, but it kind of balances it out with, it's, everything's not all negative. It's, there can be some positive aspects too. So um, I would challenge the negative thoughts. Uh, and I could talk about this forever because there's other things called cognitive biases where um, we, uh, things like uh, black and white thinking, where I, I kind of give, give myself two false choices. I have either have to do this or have to do that. And oftentimes we paint ourselves in a corner because it's not just those choices. It's, there's a ton of options in between those or overgeneralizing or jumping to conclusions. Well, this happened, therefore everything is you know, uh, gonna happen this other way or catastrophizing, uh, minimizing, rationalizing. There's a ton of them. But I think these are ways that we, there's an event out there in the world and these are the, the lenses that we view it and interpret it through and sometimes the lens distorts what we're actually seeing. And so I think it's really important to kind of be aware of that as well. And again, if, I, if that's happening kind of in, in this internal, internal space in my head, I really need somebody else's opinion sometimes and help from, a, from an objective observer to say, wait a minute, that doesn't sound right. What about this and this and this? And then sometimes I can start to see it. But to really just be aware of those, those cognitive errors that can really trap us into um, a slightly distorted viewpoint on things. Yeah, we actually did um, a, a whole webinar not that long ago on positivity. Um, so I looked up the link and I popped that into the chat. Oh, great. For everybody. So you can hear David talking about overcoming negative bias um, in, in, in detail and it's well worth uh, listening to. Um, next one here, uh, my longtime partner admits to deceiving everyone and seeking integrity earlier this year. Sorry for that. Um, we can only do so much, uh, and we need the truth. Um, while he goes to daily online support groups, he continues to deceive me on everything and therefore deceives himself, likely doing the same with his CSAT. Um, is there any point in staying with someone who still refuses to be honest and embrace sobriety? Um, yeah, gee, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. And we, we, you know, we're not mind readers, of course, and, um, we can usually break through that, but I'm sorry to hear that it happened. Um, you know, at some point we have to figure out uh, what's going on. I think, and I don't know, again, if it has to be an either this or that situation, you know, that kind of black and white piece, but it may be um, setting boundaries and gradually kind of moving away if you have to, uh, distancing yourself emotionally, physically, or it may, it may be that you've, you've hit that point but I think I would carefully consider it. I'd get, I'd get a lot of input from it. I hope you have therapeutic support you can talk about it with and, and social support as well. Because that, you know, there is a point uh, and it does come where it's just, okay, this is not working anymore. And sometimes actually that's the best thing for the addict as well is to really have that consequence uh, as a wake up call. But um, I, I would approach that carefully. Those are big decisions. And I would make sure, you know, I've got all the facts straight uh, in the first place and get a lot of help on making the decision. So it's not impulsive, but those, that decision you ask, is there any point in staying? At some point there may not be, but, but I think you really wanna make sure that's a carefully considered decision with, with all the information, all the input you have. So I'm sorry you're in that space. That's, that's a tough spot to be in. Okay, next one here. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that too. You know, the basis of any good relationship is emotional intimacy, which is built on vulnerability, which is built on trust. And if I can't trust you, I can't be vulnerable with you and we can't have emotional intimacy. And you know, when cheating occurs, you know, relationship trust is, is just crushed. Um, and it takes a while to build that back. And it also takes a while for addicts. Um, we are expert liars. We are expert secret keepers and deceivers. Um, that's how we build our addiction and keep it active for so long. Um, it takes us a while to break that habit. Um, that said, uh, we need to break that habit and we have to put the effort in. Um, if I was in your position, and I, I don't have all the facts, but you know, just from what you've given me, I, I don't know if you've had a therapeutic disclosure yet, but I would probably at this point be insisting on a full therapeutic disclosure, disclosure um, led by an experienced CSAT who's done these before. And I would, I would almost certainly ask for a polygraph um, to occur immediately after the disclosure so that you could know that you got the, whole, the truth and the whole truth and, and, and nothing but. Um, because you know, if, you, if you're still struggling to trust him I, it's, or her, um, it's, it's a long route to rebuilding your relationship and, and, to, and to getting to intimacy. Um, so there's a, I just feel a lot of pain anytime there's a lack of honesty. Um, and, and just for the addicts listening, um, get honest. If you're not, if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with others. And if you can't be honest with others, you can't have the kind of relationships that you really want. Um, so, and it, uh, it's scary to tell the truth, but um, worth it in my experience. And I think David's too, probably. Totally. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, as depression can be genetic, is there a way to test for this? Um, as if you, if, if you don't have a family history record. So if you don't have a family history to track, um, are there ways to track a, a genetic predisposition to depression? That's a really good question. So really it's a question about a biomarker for depression. And to my knowledge, there is not one. Uh, although I'm not, that's, I'm not up on the current research there. But I think that's a really hard one um, to look at. Uh, the, what we normally do in mental health is kind of look at family history and exactly what you're saying, you, you may not have access to. So uh, that's a hard one. Um, uh, Scott, do you know of any biomarkers in that area? I don't. No, you know, they're doing so much work on biomarkers and they've identified a lot of things. I don't know that they've identified anything specific for genetics. That said, a family history of depression um, if, if you can get those records uh, it is, or at least verbal confirmation, it is usually pretty accurate. Um, and they've done research into the causes of addiction, for instance, and, and they find that it's basically half genetic and half environmental, um, and that environmental can usually trump genetic. But, um, you know, it, it, and they, they study twins who are separated at birth, things like that. So they can, right. they can follow this, but they also are able to track back the family history through records. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of anything genetic that, yes, right. but I suspect it's coming. Right, no, for sure. I, I would guess it is probably around the corner, actually. But I, I was just going to say, sometimes depression doesn't always look like we think depression looks like either. So even in a family... Where you, where you have access to, you know, anecdotal evidence or stories or relationships. Um, you know, we think of, you know, depression as being, you know, not being able to get out of bed, that kind of thing. But, but sometimes depression can be irritability or depression can be other kinds of signs that you wouldn't necessarily associate, you know, weight loss, weight gain, sleep disturbance. And so it may, there may be depression there that's not really evident either. Um, the depression is a really hard one to kind of nail down. So... Uh, <laughs> I think one of the really common manifestations of depression in men is we will engage in an addiction. We'll, we'll self-medicate our depression by just numbing ourselves perpetually with alcohol or drugs or sex or porn or whatever it is we do. Right, for sure. So, so um, the family history would show alcoholism with right. that masking depression, you know. Right. The other thing I'll just say, because it's a little opportunity to talk about intergenerational stuff here, is that um, these emotional issues, addiction, other kinds of things can be passed down from one generation to the next. And we, we see this in uh, trauma and traumatic repetition where 
Um, you know, my father was kind of wounded and abused. And so he's much more likely to pass those kind of behaviors on to me. And usually with the vow that, you know, he would never do that. And, and how many of us have grown up with an alcoholic parent saying, I'm never going to be like him. And then suddenly we find ourselves just like that. And so I think that people fall into these things, but I always emphasize to, to my clients that recovery is an opportunity to, to stop this flow from one generation to the next to the next, right? We can intervene on our, and so this doesn't have to happen to our own children. And I think that's a really important um, benefit of recovery that a lot of people don't even consider at first, but because you're really interrupting a lot of patterns of dysfunction that will be, will continue to flow down from generation to the next until we actively stop it. So yeah, good point. Um, next one here, I'm in recovery for porn addiction and I'm trying to op occupy myself with hobbies, etc. as my triggers are loneliness and boredom. Um, should I also be learning to how learning how to deal with being able to do nothing. Um, do you have some advice for learning how to handle the times when I'm alone uh, or how to better handle the times when I'm alone? This is a great question. And before I turn it over to David, because I'm very interested in it as a response, I will tell you that my triggers are loneliness and boredom. Um, and I do not handle nothing very well. <laughs> um, and I do not handle uh, unstructured free time alone very well. So David, Tell us how to handle this, please. The, oh, the, the magic answer. Um, yeah, so this is a great, great question because this like nails all the things that are so triggering um, for a lot of addicts, right? That sense of not being connected, no, nowhere to belong. Um, but I wanna emphasize boredom here and that kind of unoccupied space because I think of sex and porn addiction and chem sex addiction as intensity addictions. These are all Addictions based on intensity, excitement, thrill, risk, uh, high, high intensity, in fact. Uh, and all that kind of leads to this constant churning and need for excitement and intensity, and which sometimes spills over to anxiety. It's not always a fun trip. But um, what we learn to do is to not have any tolerance at all for, for downtime, for boredom. Um, and why? Because if we're unoccupied, if we're not distracted, and I think that's an operant word here, if we're not distracted, um, we start to feel feelings that are starting to bubble up. And we're not really big fans of feelings and especially unpleasant feelings that may come up. So if, I'm, if I've been using my addiction to kind of avoid, which is a classic move on an, an addict's part, to avoid feeling anxiety or to avoid feeling lonely or to avoid feeling anything, um, when, I'm, when I'm unoccupied, when I'm not distracted, when I'm bored, um, I'm starting to feel those feelings and that's pretty darn uncomfortable. And so um, it's a real relapse risk. And it's one that people don't initially, I think, get intuitively, it's like boredom, but it, it, for somebody who's used to a lot of intensity, uh, boredom is a, is a risk. Uh, and loneliness too, because what it is, it's a, it's a kind of low energy, space where you're not distracted, you're kind of aware of being lonely, right? We're aware of those feelings. So what to do? Um, what, I, what I recommend to my clients is to um, learn how to tolerate those feelings and those spaces in ever increasing amounts. And so it may be that you can just do 10 minutes at first without having to kind of jump somewhere. Uh, in your mind, at least. And so maybe you can go to for 15 the next time and to just try to slowly build up. It's it's like building a muscle. You have to kind of practice and repeat and practice and repeat um, where you can start to tolerate. It's a, it's a matter of tolerating that empty space and tolerating the feelings that start to come up within you and regular self-regulating, calming yourself down, talking yourself, breathing. Uh, there's all kinds of ways. And I guess here I would, in terms of different skills, I would introduce just different grounding skills, what I call grounding skills with it, which is just a lot of breath work, you know, the four, seven, eight breathing or, or other deep kind of breathing. Um, uh, exercise, grounding, get putting your feet on the floor, um, the sen senses, the five senses, kind of grounding exercises. All those things are helpful to just kind of learn to be comfortable sitting in my own skin. And I think that's a, that's a, it sounds easy, but it's really hard for addicts to do. And, but it's something, it's a skill and it's a skill that can be built and um, improved upon. Um, that said, um, we always talk about 
we look at our schedules with with addicts leaving Seek Integrity, and like what are, what are they going to do, especially work, because we know that intensity addicts, uh, if they're not acting out in their addictive behaviors, it's really really easy to move to move all that energy and motivation into work. And so uh, we always ask people to commit to a certain kind of normal, sane level of work each week because uh, a lot of people will go into recovery and jump right into you know, 80 hours of work. And they're just, they're just avoiding and doing all the same stuff with a different socially acceptable outlet. So, so be careful about that. And the other thing I wanna say is that it's not, the ideal here is not to, to occupy every moment of your time, right? That's not the solution because it's really important for our mental health to have downtime, to have quiet time, to have, to have open space in your calendar where you may be bored, um, but and to have alone time and not lonely, but have time by yourself because that's also an important skill that we need to develop to learn to, to sit with ourselves, to sit with our feelings, to reflect, to listen, to be quiet. You know, those are all really important skills for recovery that if we're like afraid to kind of ever be still for fear of what's gonna come up, we're, we're always kind of running from it. And so I'd really encourage you to stop running and just learn how to practice it. And uh, you may even wanna really up the ante a little bit and, and use some recovery tools, do some bookending. You know, say, call your sponsor or call a recovery person, say, I'm gonna, gonna sit for 15 minutes, you know, and be bored. And then at the other end, make a call, do some journaling, see if there's some, something came up for you. The gift of that, by the way, is that if you can start to learn to do that, you're going to really start to get in tune with some of your inner voices, your thoughts, feelings, things that might have eluded you before. You're going to be quiet enough because there's not all the distraction and noise. You're going to be quiet enough to be able to really hear it and feel it. And I think that's, that's the, the beauty of that. Yeah, you know, I said earlier, you know, I don't sit still very well. I still don't sit still, sit still very well. He said moving in his seat, I he might ask. <laughs> fidgeting and, yeah, uh, petting the cat and trying to clean with the other hand. Um, but I, I do set aside some time each day to kind of meditate and do a gratitude list and, and just be quiet. And, and, you know, everything is turned off. There's no noise. Um, the cats are shut out of the room. Um, just a few minutes at least every day to sort of calm everything. Um, that said, um, you know, my first two years of recovery, you, you've heard us talk about circle plans and boundary plans, at least I hope you have. Um, if you haven't, um, sex addicts create this three-tiered plan for sobriety. The inner circle of the inner boundary is problem behaviors, you know, the stuff we need to stop, the unsober behaviors. The middle circle or middle boundary is slippery stuff that can lead us back into the inner boundary or the, the problem stuff. And then we have an outer circle, which is healthy stuff we can do. And you you are doing hobbies, it says here, and that's great. Um, I kept my circle plan with me for a couple of years, a little printed out version, because this was before we had these lovely digital frogs. So I had a little printed out version of this thing that was stuffed in my wallet, not because I couldn't remember what my bottom line behaviors were or my slippery behaviors, but because I struggled to fill the hours. Um, because I had been acting out five and six hours a day for years. I didn't know what to do with my free time. So I had to have a list that I could go to and go, oh, I can clean the house. Oh, I can buy some healthy food and cook a dinner. Or, you know, I can go for a long walk or I can go to the gym or I can, you know, any number of things. You know, I can go to a meeting. I can talk to someone. I can go out. You know, I needed that list because I didn't know how to fill the hours. Um, and I did not deal well with boredom. Um, and I still don't, but I'm better uh, than I used to be because I've worked on it, as David suggested, a little bit at a time. Um, and you know, 20 years into this process, I can tolerate a plane ride when I forget to bring a book. Barely. Well, really <laughs> but I can tolerate it. That's my worst nightmare. <laughs> Being on a flight from Florida to California without a book. Oh, Lord. Yeah, that's my nightmare. Yep, yeah. There we go. <laughs> Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about why I take on and act on information and advice from a therapist or a fellow group member uh, far better than when the same information comes from my wife? Um, I don't feel like I'm doing it intentionally. It really frustrates me, frustrates my wife um, who sees me acting on information that someone else told me that she feels like she told me months ago. This is really common, number one, and uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to David. Yeah, thank you for 
bringing this up because it's it is a phenomenon. Uh, it's always um, kind of amusing if I have a couple in my office. Um, I might say something, uh, and exactly what you just said, uh, the wife or the husband, or the husband and the husband, whoever will turn and say, "I've I've been telling you that for you know two years." Um, but it, there's something about I don't know if it's an authority figure or just a third person saying it. But I think sometimes when we are in an intimate relationship with somebody, we have, um, especially if there's been some trouble in that relationship, it's really hard to hear what that person is saying and hear it with objective ears. Um, and so I think it's just kind of, it's, it's very common that I don't, think, I don't even know if there's anything wrong with it. It just seems to be the way the world works with these kind of phenomenon. I think the, what I would take away from that is just to, um, have lots of input in your life and, and see. But it is very frustrating for a spouse to witness that going on. Um, the other thing that often happens in that situation is that uh, people will start talking and say stuff that they, um, I think at some level, not even consciously, never really felt comfortable saying to their spouse before, but they can say it with a third person in the room um, because they can maybe say it to me about their spouse sitting next to them. But um, I think that all these things are just kind of normal in terms of how couples interact, and especially if there's an, a therapist or a, a third person on board. But I think it's just totally normal. And I can't really explain why it is, except we uh, have a hard time seeing, um, uh, seeing our spouse sometimes as, as having uh, authority or wisdom or knowledge about this. We have blind spots and uh, that's an issue in and of itself, but um, I think it's pretty normal. I wouldn't get too concerned about it, although it is frustrating for the spouse for sure. Yeah, I, I kind of liken this to the parent-child relationship. I, I This was a while back when my sister's kids were little and um, the oldest one was being just really horrible to her two younger siblings. And my sister was trying to, you know, why are you being so horrible? To, I'm not and arguing and they blah, 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 blah. And a couple of days later, I was there and she was doing the same thing. And her friend went, Katie, you were so mean to your brother and sister. And Katie went, I am? <laughs> and then she apologized. <laughs> right. You know, and I think this is just normal. The, the, the people that we, we mute them somehow. Um, we can, I, and I don't know why. <laughs> It's, but it happens, and it really happens. I, I get it from, I hear, because uh, I do a couple of betrayed partner things, and the betrayed partners are like, why won't he listen to me? He'll listen to you when you say it, he listens. He doesn't, they listen, you know, I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's just normal. I can't really explain it either, but it is very common. Yeah. Um, um, on personality traits, do addicts usually score high on neuroticism uh, and or low on conscientiousness? Um, do these scores change temporarily when there is active addiction and revert back to normal once the addiction stops? Um, or do higher scores indicate addictive personality? Um, I've seen my job uh, performance suffer due to conflicts, um, due to higher neuroticism or conscientiousness during addiction. Um, so what, what personality traits do we see from addicts and do they re go away? Do they heal uh, when we get sober? Yeah, yeah. So there's a lot of commonality and certain traits among addicts across addictions, right? Um, we tend to see uh, a lot of kind of self-absorption, a lot of, especially with sex addiction, a lot of narcissism, classically, um, a lot of... Um, I guess what this person calling neuroticism, a lot of what I guess would could be called neurotic behaviors, a lot of uh, anxiety, a lot of uh, obsessive compulsive thinking, a lot of, um, and frankly, ways, because I think this is where it ties into addiction, ways of dealing with, with past traumatic experiences. And, uh, and some of that is done by avoidance, some of that is done by repetition. There's different responses people have to that. Um, and rarely uh, does um, conscientiousness or, or consciousness even come into the, the ball game when, when an addict is active, because that's just not, 
the whole point of addiction really is to kind of avoid and to create this almost an alternate universe that people can step into the little fantasy land that that's unrelated to reality in many cases. And so um, it's not all about being conscientious or, or awake even or conscious. Um, it's about uh, escape and avoidance. And so I think whatever features contribute to that um, are the ones we see. Now, there are, for, I would say for the most part, for, for most people, a lot of these traits are, are very movable. Once you get into recovery, you can do a lot of work on yourself. These are not fixed traits that are gonna be there forever. Um, if there's work done, now that, that requires a lot of healing, it can require a lot of time, especially if there's trauma, neglect, enmeshment, you know, all these things that we can see um, take some time and really hard work to straighten out, but it can be done. Um, there are other, uh, I guess, more fixed personality traits that we can see. Um, some of the narcissistic stuff can, can move from sort of behaviors into more a whole personality type. There can be antisocial personality types. There can be borderline. There can be other kinds of stuff that tend to be more fixed. Um, and in those cases, I think you have to kind of work with them, work around them if we can. Um, and that doesn't mean those people can't recover, by the way. Anybody can recover. Um, it's just there's different approaches and different strategies for, for different kinds of starting points. But I think most of, this most of the time, I would, I'd be hard pressed to say that, to tell any client of mine that um, this is never going to get better. Because I think um, even if something is a pretty fixed personality trait, um, it's going to be aggravated by addiction. And if we can get the addiction out of the picture, it's going to improve. And if there's something missing that often is the case, like empathy or this ability to relate to other people, um, those are skills that can be learned. And those skills convert into um, ways of feeling and being and experiencing the world that can be new and different for an addict in recovery. So I think I, I'm, I tend to be very optimistic and hopeful about these things. I mean, are there, are there situations, are there biochemical things? Yeah, those are, can be maybe controlled with medicine. I'm not gonna, all the therapy in the world may not change those. But I think for most of the stuff we see in the realm of addiction, um, as opposed to maybe more what we call serious and persistent mental illness, where it gets much more complicated and, and severe, frankly. Um, with the addictive world, I think most things will, will improve and can change for the better. I mean, let's use the 12 step, the language of 12 step programs here and talk about character defects. I mean, character defects aren't necessarily defects until they reach a certain level. They're simply traits, like I'm really stubborn. That's a character trait. It's a character defect when it gets out of control, which it does in my addiction, uh, as does my narcissism and my combativeness and certain things. You know, they escalate in my addiction and they become character defects. So steps four and five in the 12 steps uncover these. And then six, seven uh, are, are aimed at working on them and, and bringing them back down to a healthier level. Um, and, and the 12 steps are actually designed to do that as is therapy, uh, as are therapy groups and, and all sorts of ways to go about reining in our personality traits that, that kind of take over and cause problems. Exactly. Um, and you know, I think addiction brings out the worst of our character traits. You know, the things that are problematic will be heightened in our addiction and then we can get them back to normal. Um, in, in our sobriety, I'm with David. I, 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 I mean, I'm such a different seeming person now than I was in my active addiction. I mean, people who know me now and who hear about my active addiction, like, really? Because they just don't see that. I don't behave that way. And I think, you know, both you and I, Scott, have been around 12 step meetings a long time, decades. And, and, you know, I've seen people that I really had very little hope for over time if they really applied themselves and did the work, totally transform themselves, right? Um, really miraculous kind of changes in these people that um, just aren't the same people. And, and so, yeah, there is movement possible here. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna pull this one out of the chat feature. Um, someone is in their 60s. They've been an active addict for over 30 years. Is there an estimate for the time of healing? Um, weeks, months, years, decades, um, is that even answerable? 
Yeah, that, that's a tough one uh, to, to answer with any kind of authority, um, because frankly, it's, it's highly individual. It depends on the circumstance, the starting point, uh, the life, you know, what their level of commitment, their willingness, surrender, all that stuff are all factors that, that determine that. Um, I will say I've seen people come in to program in their 60s or 70. I had a 70 year old meth client a couple of years ago who, who just got caught up in the meth scene, believe it or not, and really bottomed out and is doing very well. So um, I, I think it, it, you really can't really answer that. We do know, I mentioned it earlier tonight that you know the, the, the brain repair um, is slower, the, the, the older we get, uh, but it doesn't stop, it, it still occurs. And so I think that, the, the thing I would worry about as people get older um, is, is more the psychosocial support, uh, the, the loneliness, isolation, you know, how is there, do they, do they have the network of people around them to help? I think that's really the, the magic factor here. Um, not just the person themselves, but the, the environment they find themselves in. And is it, a, is it one that's conducive and supportive of them moving forward in recovery? Um, that's probably the, the most important factor in that situation. And the, the nice thing about recovery is there is no destination. Um, it's a journey. I, I am constantly learning and constantly healing and constantly growing as part of my recovery. And David has a lot more time than I do. And I, I, I would suspect he'd say the same thing. I mean, if I don't learn something new and grow in some way, I haven't had a very good day. <laughs> you know? No, and I'm, I'm quite aware. It, it's like... I'm not a, a huge uh, fish person, but from what I understand, they talk about sharks, right? Sharks can never sit still. Um, I don't want to repair, compare addiction recovery to sharks, but, but uh, it's the same thing. I think we have to keep in motion. We can't, I, if I'm just doing nothing toward my recovery, I'm kind of going backwards. I need to constantly be doing, moving forward and taking action. And I'm, I have 40 some years in recovery now. I'm still doing that every day. And so I think it's important to, to keep doing that, keep moving forward. Um, okay, uh, next one here, we got a little bit of time left. My husband cheated on me for five years and now after finding out I'm in so much distress um, and he has anger issues, so he doesn't let me tell him my boundaries. Um, how do I put my point across when someone doesn't wanna listen? Um, I really want to stay, but he's putting me in a dark emotional place. Um, so he has anger issues, doesn't wanna hear the boundaries. Um, Right, so when there's anger like this, um, it's, it's a defense, it's a way of pushing people away, right? And, uh, and it's working um, because he's not having the conversation that he needs to have. Um, so anger is really an, a, a huge barrier to those, the kind of effective communication you're looking for, as you know. Um, at some point though you're you're powerless over him i know you want to have this conversation you want to express your needs you need to express those boundaries in terms of recovery but if he's not willing to listen there's really no way you can make him listen the one thing that might work um, is to bring in a third person like a, a couples therapist or a counselor or somebody else um, sometimes that's enough um, to shift the balance slightly and have that conversation in the office of somebody else who can interrupt and can push back and set rules for engagement and how the conversation is gonna go and kind of be a referee, um, that can work sometimes um, and sometimes not. And so I think it just really depends on the motivation, but um, it, I would say basically, I don't think you can by yourself, if somebody's refusing to listen and just being argumentative and, and angry, uh, where do you go with that? You know, so. Uh, you're in a tough spot and a and dark emotional place. I understand that because um, you're, you're being kind of put in a box here where you can't uh, take the actions you need to take to move forward in your recovery. And so this is a huge barrier and it's a serious issue. So I would, I guess the next step I would suggest is getting a third person involved where you can go to an office and, and say, um, and have, try to have that conversation with somebody kind of guiding you both to do that. If your person is willing to do that, he may or may not. But that's that's what I would suggest there. Yeah, and, and we've got another almost it's almost exactly the same question about boundaries and being shut down. Um, so yeah, you've got to bring in some help, um, or you're going to continue this dance. Um, Susan, Dr. Sue Sue Johnson has a book called Hold Me Tight, 
Um, I highly recommend reading it. She, she invented what we call emotionally focused therapy. And she talks about the dance that couples do. I know the steps, you know the steps. We just keep doing the same dance over and over and we run into the same roadblocks over and over, even though we both know this is really unhealthy for us and it's unhealthy for our relationship, but we can't break out of it because we're just too entrenched. Um, so the, the emotionally focused, focused therapy is, is all about sort of breaking that dance and hearing each other emotionally and, and proceeding from there. Um, so if you're going to find um, a couples counselor, um, if, if you've got somebody who's a CSAT who also is trained in EFT, as it's called, um, you've hit the jackpot, I think, because um, both of the couples were, were, were getting questions from here. Um, I, I just feel like a, a third party counselor uh, who's really good, who understands sex addiction, but also understands how to break through this dance. Um, totally. So pick up Sue Johnson's book, Hold Me Tight. Yeah, um, totally yes. agree with that. Good. Um, yeah. Um, I am the partner of a sex and porn. This will be our last one here. We've got a couple we're, we're not going to get to. I apologize. Um, I'm the partner of a sex and porn addict of 44 years. I feel strong resentment coming from him. Um, I began to recognize and feel this resentment approximately 15 years ago. This is in a 44 year marriage, I believe. Um, so 30 years into his addiction. Um, now, 18 months post discovery, the feelings of resentment are, are still there. Can you please share what might be the cause of the resentment? It's an interesting question. Right. So I think when we have this anger going on with these resentments, uh, it's again, just a huge barrier. In my experience, addicts kind of like to collect resentments. Uh, there's or grievances yeah. and we kind of hold on to those and they're kind of little bits of, they're little fuel pellets for us to kind of get outraged and get it worked up and, and ultimately rationalize whatever we want to do. Uh, so we don't feel quite as bad about doing it. Um, so I think, you know, resentments are just really, really toxic to the addict and to the partner as you're, uh, making clear. Um, the, the, so the resentments are just kind of these old angers that should have been dealt with years ago that have been kind of accumulated and saved. And now they, they've taken a life of their own. Um, and so again, it, it comes down to the partner's willingness to, I mean, that, I mean your, your partner, not the, the betrayed partner, but the addict's part, the addict's role is to really become willing to look at this and do something about it. But that there's a certain um, emotional power that these resentments have that, that it's, they're seductive to the addict. And they, there's a little bit of a rush. There's some intensity that goes with anger and resentments. And it kind of feeds that whole thing where the addict as, as a way of denial and kind of justification can feel this righteous indignation, right? There's nothing more worrisome to me about an addict having righteous indignation because that's like a permission slip to do whatever they want to do and so it's it's a dangerous combination so I'd, I'd really encourage him or her to get um the kind of support to to really deal with that anger there there a therapist can deal with a lot of the anger issues and see what's going on and see if there's maybe other causes that might be there but i suspect it's 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 just an accumulation and it's habit and it's an unwillingness on the addict's part to deal with it and to let it go. Early in my recovery, um, one of my uh, then friends, who's still a very close friend, because um, he tells me the truth, uh, looked at me and said, do you want to be right or do you want to be sober? Uh, and which pissed me off at the time, but I, you know, I get it. I mean, holding on to a resentment, especially a powerful resentment against someone I, I'm deeply connected to, like a spouse, for instance, is just holding on to a reason for relapse. It's just it's exactly. keeping an excuse to relapse. And I, there's no reason for me to do that if I wanna be sober. You know? So I love it. Do I wanna be right or do I wanna be sober? Well, I love that. I take a decision and I wanted to be sober. Um, yeah. So yeah. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions today, um, but thank you for bringing great questions and um, maybe we'll do straight up Q and A's again here in the future. Um, we get some more questions this yeah, way. Yeah. You know, once in a while, we'll do one of these. So thank you for being here. Thank you for great questions, David. Thank you for thank being you, here and, and for sharing your time with us. Yeah. Pleasure. See you next we'll week. see everybody next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.